following this in the web this is a kind of participation we don't see in a spade the sociological research institute in spain uh, doesn't consider this kind of digital demoscopy we need perspective everyday life uh, clouds uh, everything just for year terms even 10 years uh, prospects but uh, reviewing some uh, dates 2008 uh, happened something that in, in 1918, sorry, the decline of civilization, Herbert Spencer was translated, uh, this decline of civilization's book was translated immediately. He said in his analysis of five civilizations on the planet, he understood that cultures are born, they develop and then die and the, for him, the Western world was going into decline in 1918, but he couldn't imagine the innovations of this uh, century. The impact of uh, Spengler was important. There was a translation in 1920-something, had a preface by Ortega y Gasset, one of the great philosophers uh, in Spain. Uh, he was discussing with uh, Miguel de Unamuno, the main uh, op uh, in the media of that time. They were discussing about modernity, of the, the preservation of the rural way of life. That was a debate in 1918. The Revista de Occidente, the journal founded by Ortega Gasset makes reference to the conflict that they considered that Western world had to face in 1988 after the end of the First World War. Some of the tinnits of or the, or the statements of Spengler um, didn't prove true. For instance, uh, the energy revolution that has allowed to have a almost uh, 8 billion inhabitants in, in the world. When in 2118, when we will not be alive here, uh, what is going to happen? Will we be able to keep the cultural, technological conditions for the follow for the next century? Conditions are are harsh. There is a uh, token document, uh, which is the Meadow uh, report about the limits of the planetary system. They made some simulations that you can see that they then they set, they already consider margarita is being um, working about uh, metabolism metabolism simulation they would uh, consider that the available resources after the second world war were always getting short the consumption of non-renewal resources and the emission had to have a, had to have a limit and the meadows report said that at a certain point in the next decade the parameters of the planet metabolism should change its part either there is a revolution or decline is clear we should analyze this with uh, with experts until now the main uh, energy resource, uh, energy source is oil. There are different uh, scenarios. It seems that the trend is that the oil supply is going to be getting shorter and shorter and the alternatives are not clear. It's uh, more a uh, question of hope or, you know, a lottery rather than objective facts. Uh, conventional or, or unconventional oil is going to 
set around uh, 100 or 100 and something dollars uh, uh, for uh, oil drum uh, when the economy of a country is linked to oil consumption, the systems are in danger, not to say anything about biodiversity, greenhouse effect, nitrogen or phosphorus emissions of the supply of phosphorus in the coming years. It seems that the price of energy and economic recession has a, had a, have a clear correlation. It happened in the 70s when the oil peak that was uh, predicted by a Hoover, the Hoover peak, uh, predicted uh, a decade before, uh, the USA is not uh, able to supply oil in the adequate conditions, so there is this oil peak, and in 2007-2009 we had a new convulsion, a turbulence in the planetary um, scenario, the uh, United Nations uh, Fund for Food uh, these are recent images from a Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, scientist that are working with, together with the Defense uh, Ministry about the challenges. Margarita is an expert about this. There are several grounds. Uh, the Commissioner, Carmen Nubel, said that uh, although synergies, uh, effects uh, can be distracted, solutions can also be synergic. The adding of positive uh, impulses but the convergence of uh, a growing energy price, it, many economists say that economies can't make it with those prices. Then the rate of uh, energy return, the relationship between my investment in energy and the energy I get, the return rate for oil was 10, as 100 before the Hoover peak, but after several decades we are depending on sources with returns rate between 40 and 15. This means that we always get less energy for our investment because we have to look for deeper uh, sources of energy into the soil and so on. Um, besides the economy, the always more expensive energy places us uh, facing a very difficult conjuncture if there are no alternative solutions. Pessimist arguments uh, are heralded by the MIT, for instance, uh, one of the most powerful forum uh, for, uh, for innovation and technology, most uh, innovation from uh, from tactile screens, etc. They have a U theory that says that we have we are facing different bubbles. That if they coincide, it's a trouble for us. There is a first bubble, which is uh, the finite resources. Uh, uh, bubble, we have financial bubbles that are causing the real economies to accumulate <laughs> even in the industrial sector we have a tech bubble they also speak of a leadership bubble subject leaders that appear in the media, but they, they blow in a few weeks. Many presidents have disappeared from sight. We have a consumption bubble that seems to be addressed. And we have also a governance bubble. 
and generally speaking we have also a property bubble this is uh, what constitutes a systemic challenge uh, destructive synergies uh, destructive chainings on the other hand, we have uh, scenarios like the European Parliament, the Commission, the dialogue with the member states, the issuing of directives, in this case the legal framework um, uh, argued by Carmenu Bella. It's, uh, the dream would be for 2050, we will live properly, orderly, properly, respecting the ecological limits of the planet. Our prosperity will be the consequence of a circular, innovative economy with no waste. Natural resources are uh, managed sustainably. The resilience of our society is hence uh, strengthened. Our Hypocarbon consumption combines resources, setting the pace for a sustainable economy at the world level. This is a dream nowadays. This is a dream made by our representative United Nations. On the other hand, we are in a uh, relaunching phase of the um, goals, uh, the COP23 about climate change. We have very skeptical uh, groups saying that there are no advancement and other things that we are in the on the good path sustainable uh, development goals are poverty non-polluting energy decent work climate um, with clear indicators about uh, working with the third sector organizations one of the scenarios that we pose in the online uh, form would be the techno optimist goal in which uh, both the finance capital and tech capital but also institutional capital that we have built uh, is going to be able by uh, uh, science and tech to allow us alternatives viable alternatives into the framework that we are working in. There, are, there is techno-optimism of one of the big challenges that humanity has. For 2050, we will be more than 9 billion people on the planet. And it's not clear how these people is going to be fed, etc. For techno-optimists, uh, there is a road ahead, a third uh, wave, the third green revolution that will produce an in a smart, climatically wise uh, agriculture, new solutions for energy sources and the productivity of agro of ecosystems through biochemicals and lab innovations. We will have uh, better effic efficiency for fertilizer through drones. Uh, for watering and renewable energies, nanotechnologies are one of the fields, fields they consider that can save us uh, to avoid the famines uh, of a larger population. The frontiers of Europe are always more uh, yeah, under siege. Uh, Many people, several thousands, have died trying to enter into Europe. Um, Olivier Schutter recently said that agroecology, the feeding system, food systems, locally based, when uh, cities are fed by these areas and the waste goes back to the rural areas, will be perfectly able to keep a 9 billion uh, uh, in inhabitants planet. We have different conflicting scenarios about food. The debate about the common agricultural policy has uh, 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 opposed position. 
those saying that the revolution will be technological, the other says that it will be about a change of model. This is, uh, there is this uh, CSA for uh, climatically smart agriculture, but we have the other opposite, uh, an organization like Grain that says that the, f the main uh, factor for greenhouse gases is not planetary transport. Is the food system in its whole? The fertilizers uh, have a great energy intensity, maritime and transportation, packaging, plastics, and then the generation of waste. If we include all the aspects of the life cycle of the uh, food product, that is more polluting than the construction or energy sector that were considered the main generator and this hasn't been integrated. There are emissions market for the great gen so-called ger great generation, but the diffuse sectors are not um, integrated into this discourse. The main f uh, emission factor of greenhouse uh, gases in, in a city like Madrid that you have people with houses in the mountains. The main factor in for a, of emissions in a family with everyday displacement is not heating, is not the car, is food. So they they are right. Movements that are being born institutionally and in dialogue with the third sector give us hope that. Uh, some reforms or even something revolutionary elements could emerge, for instance, for per 1000 platform. We were debating yesterday with the representatives of the Commission the importance of the carbon uh, consumed by the soil and the importance of uh, fertile soil in order to avoid the use of fertilizers. Uh, so, second scenario, the first is techno-optimism, institutions and market are going to solve uh, problems we are facing in the next decade. Second, is it necessary, is a re profound revolution necessary involving engaging institutions, a scenario in which uh, ecological transition is uh, operating and with a more a deeper human dimension, not just considering humans as voters or just our consumers into the bubble at home with a family, with a core family as a basic entity in society. The common good economy will be an option, but there are others. Do you think that we need a deep reform or even a revolutionary of institutions, revolutionary process of institutions and market. The fact is that the emission of greenhouse gases in food, about food, makes us think that people rethinking their relationship to nutrition and food could change prospects. This is something published by the Environmental Ministry in France, uh, the Grenelle. We have pineapple, green beans, and water that we can consume. In one case, the pineapple came by plane, uh, meat is bill, which needs 25 kilos of uh, grass, beans are frozen, so they have consumed en electric energy, the bottle is packed, the water is packed, so that would be six kilos for every menu, uh, menu. On the other hand, will the citizens be able to integrate a new menu, chicken, which just consumes three kilos, beans are fresh uh, from local uh, producers, the pineapple has come by, uh, by ship, and the water is into a jar. That would be 10% of greenhouse emissions. So, if the market and the citizens uh, integrate this, there is alternative of are we already late? 
there is revolution. This is a journalist, British journalist, about food revolution. There are cities everywhere. We have experts here that are working for about food as key for a health for the health policies change, educational policies change, food supply, uh, social changes and everything. There are cities that are into B scenario, revolutionary aspects with very uh, there, very bold uh, bets. One is the Bristol option. Bristol has a policy in which they are reforming or trying to reform uh, with the municipal taxes. They have local currencies. They have change in redistribution models, uh, edible gardens, uh, soil protection with a different manage of carbon, but also uh, the amount of organic matter in our gardens, the engagement of schools, shops and businesses buying local and not the big uh, providers. There are options. Another option, always uh, more well known, is not a reform, but is thinking that the, uh, the concentration of power by corporations the drifting away of uh, financial markets or the inputs and outputs generated by societies that affect our planet should lead, all this should lead to environmental impositions, this topical uh, scenario of uh, eco-fascism, growing poverty, people that can have access, have access to finite resources, etc. Do you think that in the next uh, 30 years we are going to face this non-desirable planet in which you have impositions through market prices or through legislation and police work to contain the risks ahead for the planet? Some fear some intellectuals Ugo, like uh, Ugo Bardi, an Italian professor that says that the Hoover peak goes up at the same rate as the constant of planetary metabolism, population, population, consumption. He considers that they are going to go down at the same rate. We are talking already of the Seneca uh, curve. Ugo Bardi says that there is a curve that is there will be a wave, the Hokusai wave. We will be thinking that we are at the peak of the wave, but after the peak or beneath the peak, there is the catastrophe, like when a wave wave breaks. We don't know what the future will be. There are many people thinking in different scenarios, and what we ask you is that we discuss all together which of these scenarios is more likely, more feasible, which one of them do you think there is no reason to think about them, and which of them do you think that there is ground for them to realize, to become real. Who is uh, first? Uh, thank you for inviting me on behalf of the Green Growth uh, Group uh, and Telefonica. It doesn't uh, happen uh, frequently that we are invited to do philosophy, because normally we are in a panel about uh, PPAs or and renewable energies, a rather technical panel in, in, in this sense. This panel seems so interesting to me because really this kind of uh, conversations uh, are those with which we can engage, we can have the consumer involved. In Telefonica 
we have launched uh, several initiatives based uh, on uh, awareness raising by the consumers because we know the return of this initiative is not short term and we are pretty disappointed uh, in by the reaction of the consumers. It's, it's, it's becoming really difficult. This conservation seems a, seem a bit intellectual, but actually they are very important. We have the tendency, both people and uh, corporations and government, to think short term. We are obsessed with short term. This make it makes it so difficult to think about will, what will be the scenario, the likely scenario for 2050. Coming from Telefonica, I am a techno-optimist. Uh, we are techno-optimist in the sense that there is a timing issue uh, that has been uh, work through, you have uh, mentioned some solutions related to the basic uh, needs and basic problems that could make us think of a more pessimist scenario. But when we take a look about what uh, the, the ongoing process is about smart agriculture, vertical agriculture, local agriculture, gene edition, everything that is been doing about artificial meat or uh, stem cells uh, generate meat, stem cell generated meat. All the experts uh, working on these issues are convinced that we'll, we are going to make it about being more efficient, about resource management, about uh, avoiding uh, uh, resource uh, weight of the necessary uh, resources for food, for uh, the uh, 9 billion people that we will have in, for in, at that point, at that time, and uh, actually, with regards to housing or energy issues, we are witnessing that the technological solutions are already at work. There are solutions that, because of different reasons, uh, they are not still in the market, but the potential lead us to think that uh, the whole energy part, the use of oil, for instance, the charts, uh, the graphs you were showing were pretty pessimist, but others say that in 20, 30 years we will be um, about the 90 percent of electric energy consumption and oil will have no relevance. So, in this sense, uh, uh, if we say, if we question whether technology is going to give us solutions to the environmental problems posed, I think we shouldn't be concerned or worried. It seems more uh, concerning is it more worrying that people working at that are very are few and there are different groups in society that from the time in point of view are lagging behind so these scenarios that we are exposing here seem very extreme I think that the most likely scenario will be an intermediate scenario in which of course, technology offers us solutions, but it's true that we need a regulatory framework helping us and helping these solutions to come sooner to lower prices that are so necessary to uh, engage and involve and to 
bring these solutions uh, everywhere in the world, and particularly in the areas in which a larger uh, population growth is expected in the southern areas. So it is very important on the one hand that we uh, make the governments have a, a less shorter term vision, a more ambitious, amb ambitious vision, and helping the solution uh, relying on the market and and also this awareness uh, raising of the population of the consumers depending on the world zone in which we are or even in the zone in Europe in which we are the mm, sensibility to this, the awareness about this is very few. There are some advances about food, uh, ecological agric agriculture, uh, proximity agriculture. They are uh, getting more support, but in about many other products and services, the consumer they are, is not thinking about where it does it come from and which was the cost of its production. And this uh, awareness raising is so important. I was, uh, I was saying that in Telefonica we have an initiative which is called Echo Rating. Do you know? Does anybody know Echo Rating? Does anybody belong to Mobius Star and knows Echo Rating? This proves this proves my point. If you go to the Movistar website and you want to take a look of the at the available purchasing devices, you will see that each device has an eco rating. This indicates which is the score of uh, any device, Samsung, LG, whatever, uh, depending of the environmental footprint, uh, which minerals do they use, and also um, the social issues, uh, the respect of social issues. We do that because we believe heavily in that. We have a goal. We have set goals of a uh, hundred percent. Uh, renewables. We are into circular economy. We reuse. Uh, all devices um, in the end sustainability of everything depends on the imp on the relevance that the consumer uh, gives to it consumers should vote uh, parties political parties that in do include these topics in the political programs I am in favor of a techno-optimist vision. I, I, I support that vision, but I see that we need some, we are lacking elements that would come from the other scenarios, from the other options. It's a, it's a mix with B. Thank you, Marga. Well, very different. I would like to introduce myself. I come from the Valladolid University, but not from the Genius School, but from a group or an economy, energy, and system. It's dynamic, interdisciplinary group. We are currently working on a project about age 2020. Uh, call of the European Commission. We want to treat uh, ecology, energy, and climate change together. This model is a tool uh, to help policymakers uh, to make decisions in, in, from the energy point of view. We want to link things to each other. The Rome uh, Club uh, so base that wanted to integrate all aspects of society from economy, resources, pollution, everything. Since then, 
There has been a division. Uh, the integrated models have been based uh, either on the economy, either or uh, climate change. So the integration has been missing. We want to integrate the economy and energy. The economic, the this is a revolutionary thought that m very few economists, only ecological economists, consider it as an axiom. The rest of the economists, from the left, from the right, don't worry about energy. They have the common idea that technology is going to solve everything. But what we are witnessing in a survey is that the techno-optimist scenario is impossible. So after gathering lots of data, we were more techno-optimists when we started than now, when we gathered together the oil peak, climate change, the, the carbon peak, etc. We see that there is a, an increase of the uh, consume, consumption of uh, fossil fuels, uh, there is a bell shape, there, are, there is uh, a decreasing trend, the last would be coal, I, and we may think that this uh, increase of energy consumption is going to grow if we introduce, if we introduce uh, renewable energy sources. But to achieve that increase of renewables, we need hypotheses that should be very realistic. We are, but now we are not taking that path. The consumption of fossil is goes faster than the renewables growth rate. You can't uh, build an eolic park in, in 10 days. So we are entering into a decline that we may overcome, but it's going to be difficult to avoid chaotic scenarios. There is a shortage about the uh, fuel is uh, liquid fuels uh, are going to be needed because uh, bus transport uses them. Electrification is uh, complicated and it's not been implemented at the desired rate. The electric car is not coming. That expected revolution in mobility is not coming. 10 years, we were speaking about uh, 20 million electric cars in the world. There are so many tax shortages. They are saying that oil is a fabulous resource. The energy return is great and substituting it with other inventions like uh, batteries of electric cars, hydrogen, biofuels. Well, involves uh, things that are uh, technically worse. Batteries are 20 times less energy saving by volume unit and by weight unit. And in spite of uh, technological advances, we, not, we are not having such a good resources as oil. So we are going for less. The dynamics of our economy are not going to be able to adapt to this because the, we are in a growth economy. And if you tell the consumer that you're going to give them a car that costs the same but is four times less uh, effective or four times more expensive, we will have a, a degradation of the economic dynamic. And our economy is not prepared for those spirals. Is a pro-growth economy. Is linked to growth. Is uh, this is uh, can't adapt, can adapt to the declining rate. 
and although the renewables are giving good results, they are inferior to f fields. So the economy is not adapting to this declining rate and is not being able to adapt to the transition, energy transition to renewables. When we speak of techno-optimist uh, scenario, we are speaking of tech-solving things. But to me, that is the methodical problem. We have been uh, seeing the limits to growth for 40 years. The planetary limits are pretty clear. We don't need more research to realize that. We have problems with energy, plastics, uh, acidification of the oceans, uh, all uh, parameters uh, at the planetary level are at the red numbers, uh, they are at emergency levels. It's a serious problem and we are not uh, solving it. All the climate summits, 40 years about talking about sustainable development, but we are becoming always more unsustainable. The problem to me is the delinking, the non-integration between environmental and economic problems, technological and social problems, this unwillingness to see them together. <coughs> There is a very uh, pernicious dynamic in the relationship between uh, our capitalist economy based on growth, uh, national gross product uh, increase, and it's difficult to have more economic activity without less energy. It's a square in the circle. Technology just can put some patches but can't square the circle. When we speak of tech solutions like smart agriculture, artificial meat, more uh, effective technologies, many times we, we make the ma same mistake because we are into this growth dynamic. If we are speaking of more drones in agriculture, more tech, what are we doing? We are introducing more energy consuming energy um, technologies because chips have a very important ecological load, uh, rare minerals, always more rare minerals, etc. Hence, uh, I think that technology has an interesting role to play, but it's not the main actor in this transition or the main factor but and thinking that technology is going to solve problem is really dangerous because uh, we are losing time with fantasy solutions that lead, uh, lay, lead us nowhere if we have a low global vision uh, of hunger in the world what use is artificial meat if uh, African peasants can't buy them because they have suffered land grabbing or been have sold uh, the lands for nothing and they don't have a job to eat? Africa or we could speak of Spain. We can expect that the problems uh, are just uh, uh, the problems of other countries. So the techno-optimist scenario is not real, but now it should be discarded. We are wasting our time. We don't have a time to waste the collapse scenarios you were speaking of uh, are really scary, but they are not impossible. In, actually, I think that the eco-fascism when we have less energy and then the solution for a lesser consumption should be uh, segregate population, uh, leaving more and more population in poverty and increasing well-being and economic growth for a lesser uh, part of the population. This is happening. This is happening in the Spanish economic crisis that happened, has not been solved. Well, in Spain, we have consumed 
25 less oil than in 2007, but not because of effectiveness or electric car investment of uh, heating um, isolation, but because there is less purchasing capacity, purchasing power. There are many elements that complicate things, economic crisis, social crisis, inner energy crisis, biological crisis, feed each other. And there is something that makes things worse. When people is in crisis, is struck by different problems, they get scared scared and they support conservative political options that are not gonna change anything they are gonna they are not gonna advance for bolder uh, solutions and could make us uh, go into feedback loops that are scary um, we must change and change a lot of things about the ecological trend and humanist transition, I think that is the most positive scenario, realistic one, realistic wise, is technically realistic uh, from a point of view. I don't know whether it's uh, realistic from the sociological point of view because it involves huge uh, changes, but it is in a scenario that could help us uh, breaking these uh, feedback uh, loops, uh, perverse feedback loops that lead us to collapse. Things like agroecology, low energy consumption, agriculture, b but with very interesting returns that about uh, problems, uh, about the loss of biodiversity, environmental impacts, it could it, it 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 raises hope the management of urban transportation bioclimatic agriculture the protection of the public uh, infrastructure for people not to enter into despair spirals but all these technology are well known since uh, long technologies like uh, the management of traffic in the cities, ecological agriculture, relocalization. So we should ask why are not implemented? Why these solutions are not implemented? Why are we looking for always more complicated solutions that make us consume always more resources and become more unsustainable? Thank you. If anyone was to make some remark which scenarios are more likely or or to say something about their positions or you can intervene from the those seen in the streaming i think that we have a mechanism to pick up uh, questions from the viewers of the streaming Well, I think what you are, uh, what we're speaking about here is not a question that relies or depends on everyone's uh, uh, behavior or attitude, but be it more pessimistic, more optimistic. Personally, I, I can be very optimistic of a person, but actually the scenarios are really, really uh, dim, really, really scary. The uh, climate change issue, which is one of the uh, environmental crisis uh, aspect, which is more, more clear, more, more visible for everybody, the nitrogen cycle, the potassium cycle, not many people understand that, but uh, about in climate change, about climate change, things are not going well because the commitments of the countries after the Paris Agreement about climate change to not 
about the two degrees uh, increased uh, abutment. Since then, this was uh, 2015, since then, which countries have changed their goals? None of them. This morning, the commissioner said that Trump was getting out of the agreement in Europe. We said we have to make an effort to be more ambitious. Which is that effort? Which is that ambition? In the European Union said in 2014 that the goals were uh, for, for 2030, their goals were 40 percent. They are still 40 percent. They haven't increased their goals. So the question we are dealing with here like Margarita has said, uh, technology is important, the citizens' attitude, the steps being made about the improvement on consumption, mobility, food, but that's, that's totally not enough if there are no changes in the trends of production, consumption, transportation that are uh, on the rise. But to finish, I would like to ask Margarita, I know a, a bit of your work because I participated in uh, discussion groups with Oscar Carpintero in Madrid, and one of the proposals was that the integration of um, renewables uh, in energy consumption was the only viable uh, uh, formula for the reduction, but that would imply the consumption of materials in a way that could even neutralize fr from the energy point of view that, that improvement. So I would like you to say something about that, which uh, leads us to the conclusion that what we need are dramatic uh, reductions are in the consumption of materials everywhere in society. Somebody else? Uh, any other remark? From the streaming, is there anybody wanted to contribute? Well, what do you think about it, Margarita? I'm going to answer your question about materials. Yeah. Materials are one of the technical limits which are more important. Energy-wise, we can have energy coming from the sun indefinitely, constantly coming from the sun, constantly degrading. The materials in, in Earth are finite. They are concentrated in, mine, uh, in mines. And if we concentrate and then dump it uh, in dams or disperse it in the uh, atmosphere, on the lithosphere, to regather, then it implies huge uh, energy consumption levels. So mines are a treasure concentrated that we should be constantly recycling, not to lose them, N never lose them, because if we let them out, they disperse in the environment. Theoretically, they could be uh, recoverable, but with energy ratios that are not realistic. This should lead us to think how our, is our technology. Since the 70s, uh, technology is based on always more scarce minerals. And now, smartphones and other electronic devices that are so uh, little rely on minerals that are very scarce, that we now uh, we are extracting with a very, very environmental load. Lots of uh, earth is, has to be removed. Many are toxic. We are dumping them in dumps because uh, is they are not recyclable. This is a limit that when we have, at the point that we have dispersed all, we won't be able to have those technologies. We may have 
other technologies but less uh, effective, we may discover something, maybe not. How vital is this into the transition to renewable energy sources? Well, it is, but at the same time not. Uh, it is important because it's an absolute limit, but there are renewable technologies that can live without these, without these rare minerals, but they are less effective. Uh, solar plagues uh, are less uh, effective uh, now than uh, before. You it's not an absolute limit for renewals, but is you know always uh, producing less effectiveness. So society is more difficult, more complicated. You have to work more for less return, and the limits of minerals uh, in our recent uh, surveys say that now we have problem with silver, with iridium, gallium for 2050. They are not vital, but it's uh, really uh, worrying if we want to keep uh, an important technology, technological civilization, we are going to have big problem. Now, the problem is so absolute, but we are witnessing that we are uh, finishing with the Receipts uh, that exist in receipts. <coughs> Resources are the available ones, but are not available. So we are going to find limits with the receipts. So new mining is needed. We have to look for places where energy consumption is bigger, pollution is bigger, and that's a problem. We are in Latin America, they're speaking of extractivism, the ecological consequences of mining, with terrible consequences for the population. And this is coming to Spain. Now they are in Spain, they are asking to reopen uh, mines that were open uh, in the times of the Roman Empire. And they, so, Although we don't have an absolute scarcity of minerals, they are always more expensive because we are, don't know how to recycle. We have no circular economy about technology, about electronics. And although we can do better about agriculture, uh, closing the circles, uh, some people are doing that, but about electronics, engineering, closing cycles, there is nothing. An engineer that would want to do electronics or engineer, engineering uh, closing cycles must go to computers from the 70s because the current ones are uh, on another path. Another issue, you, well, you must know about that since you work at Telefonica. Yes, I want to uh, confirm the fact that the minerals are an important issue about the tech in the tech industry. I am not so pessimist uh, because uh, all companies working on electronics are aware, very aware, that uh, it is uh, important to enter to introduce the circular economy, the first that are not interested about an increase in the electronic devices price, take it into account the trend, are uh, these very companies. And once again, the awareness uh, raising uh, everywhere is very low. The topic of circular economy has a lot still a lot to do for the citizens to understand that we shouldn't change our smartphone every uh, two years, that uh, they can be refurbished, uh, that you can buy second-hand uh, smartphones. We are already offering that, we are working about that. 
ourselves we recycle, we use 97% of our uh, electronic devices of the systems we use. But of course, uh, there's still a lot to do, but it's a timing problem again. At the uh, I plus D level, we are advancing a lot with the goal of the circular economy in mind. We have tried to market the fair phone. It's a Dutch phone that uh, allows uh, it to be uh, unmounted and replacing the piece you need so you don't have to uh, to throw it to, uh, in the garbage because something is not working, but it's, com it's still complicated uh, for because the consumers uh, are not responding. Anybody else uh, wants to say something, please? Gracias. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to say something about timing, about techno-optimism. I would like to, to contribute with the uh, statement that for many years there have been techno-optimist uh, solutions with a counter-effect. We have sweat and uh, uh, the carpet, all the consequences of climate change, social inequality, have a relationship with this uh, technological revolution. So somehow I think it's important to know, to acknowledge that now we are not like the 30s, like in the 40s, maybe the room for uh, there is more room than than in the 30s. Now there is a perception of alarm of emergency, which is important. This means that the concern that with circular economy and with the sustainable development goals. Uh, could happen the same like 30 years about green products and ecological makeup of many firms where the uh, profound causes, deep causes were not approached. It was all about green marketing, understandably, because they had to um, raise the attention of the consumers that were concerned about green and topics, etc. But the perception is that now there is no more room for action. That actually there are some parameters that uh, support a techno-optimist scenario but should be integrated with other parameters at the larger scale. I think that uh, in, the, in the next uh, GSX scenario, technology is an important component, but uh, from the uh, corporations uh, are working about orienting uh, technology, the l low investment, high efficiency and local, uh, local ba locally based. I think that we should take into account in this fora this kind of technology, being techno-optimist but this is not considered, it's not published, it's not uh, 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 an, uh, a frequent topic I want to ask those in in the hall I you can write uh, you can solve the questionnaire online but I, I am curious to know your opinion 
The first scenario would be the techno optimist under the present institutional condition, the system of science and technology are going to lead humanity to salvation. The second would be that a humanist ecology revolution is needed. The third is that we are doomed to an eco-fascist uh, scenario. And the fourth would be that it's likely that we're going to have to face a collapse, a disappearance of the, no, uh, of the world as we know it. Who wants to raise the, the hand about the The first part is what do you think? The second is how can we commit to? We're gonna show it and the result of the of the poll. You now the by the feasibility, what do you think is more feasible, more likely uh, about uh, about this? What do you think? B scenario, revolution about uh, humanist ecology revolution. Nine. C scenario, modalities of eco fascism, very strong authoritarian capitalism. And we are heading to collapse as the most likely outcome for people. I'm going to check what people has uh, answered online. Well, international bodies are planning 2030. We could also personally plan 2030. First scenario would be my Commitment is a techno optimist. I'm into science. I'm into a startup that want to market products, trying to abide this. Do I do I commit in my personal life? I think that we will give an answer to this challenge. The market is able to uh, recognize the challenges, internalize costs. How many of you are? in favor of this option that says that personal commitment can have a good results, more science and better market. The second is my commitment is uh, for a severe transition. I want democracy, but more participative than now. We don't think likely uh, th that uh, rapid uh, change of order is likely. We are heading to sudden chaotic, but we need uh, deep reforms of public policies. We participate in social forum. We need fiscal measures in ecologic, ecological sense, a better management of resources. The fourth uh, is my compromise is with eco-social based uh, revolution. This is low, low based. The local articula articulation of markets, the using of uh, the base would be the community from the globalized society to a more communitarian uh, structures. The fourth my concern, uh, if you enter into blocks into the US, people are getting armed and uh, gathering food because they are expecting a collapse or they want to defend themselves with weapons. Uh, about this fourth scenario, do you want to say something from the personal point of view? Where do you think that is more likely? that we should commit ourselves to. I know that they are very simplified scenarios, but something simpler things help us thinking. Does anybody want to say something about that? Yo abogaría por una mezcla de los primeros tres. Como empresa, en nombre de la Telefónica o del Grupo de Crecimiento Verde, yo creo que 
nos situaríamos efectivamente en los primeros tres. Primero porque creemos realmente en los avances de la tecnología, pensamos que están ofreciendo ya muchas soluciones y van a ofrecer cada vez más porque la tecnología está evolucionando a un ritmo, como sabéis, pues cada vez más rápido y además está trabajando y se está financiando muchas soluciones en esta dirección. Pero también hace falta un entorno eh, regulatorio, eh, un entorno fiscal, eh, un entorno eh, que promueve eh, que vaya más rápido, que se aceleren eh, estas soluciones eh, tecnológicas, porque es verdad que hay un tema de timing y si no, no llegamos. Y eh, a su vez eh, necesitamos un cambio en eh, comportamiento eh, ciudadano y una, eh, un, un, una actitud diferente, un, un compromiso diferente hacia eh, en qué mundo queremos que vivirán nuestros hijos. ¿no? Y en ese sentido, pues eh, está claro que, que seguir consumiendo eh, como se ha ido consumiendo en los últimos eh, 30-40 años, pues eh, no tiene mucho futuro. Por lo que, eh, lo siento mucho porque parece la solución fácil ¿no? elegir tres, pero, pero realmente creo que, 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 hay que hay que buscar uh, uh, soluciones en, en las tres opciones. En cualquier caso, entre el B y el C, el centro de gravedad queda en el B que es una transición severa. Bueno, aquí os voy a hacer luego la pregunta más lanzada, pero en el cuestionario online podéis responder de uno a cinco en cada opción. O sea, no tenéis por qué poner yeah. solo una. Aquí lo estamos simplificando. La, la, la ventaja de los leyes es que nos permite eh, matices. Marga, ¿quieres hacer alguna observación? ¿Cuál de estas cuatro sí. crees? O mestizajes, que es el título de mestizar opciones. Bueno, y también, pues un poco recogiendo lo que decía también la, la última pregunta, que no, que no, bueno, no sé si era una pregunta o una observación, pero bueno. Eh, eh, a ver, perdón. Bueno, yo creo que hay que intentarlo. Desde luego lo que no podemos perder es la esperanza. Porque, porque a veces hablamos de todo o nada, de colapso o no colapso, pero las cosas son siempre grises. Y podemos colapsar mejor, peor, podemos caer mejor, peor, y podemos salvar muchas cosas. Y como decía, las soluciones son muy sencillas. Solutions are simple, technically simple, but our minds are focused on the other side. So we have to turn, to make a big turn, a, ma a big shift, because if we don't, if we don't make a big shift, then we will fall down the mountains. I think it is very interesting to think about low-lock technology. And from the technological point of view, I think from the public administrations and from the point of view citizens, we have to promote technologies, but just some of them, not all of them, because uh, not all technologies are sustainable. If uh, they are not sustainable, then maybe you are losing our time with technologies. Some technologies are useful and some others not. We need to invest in good technologies. Some of them are just things that we will not be able to sustain in the future. And about personal engagement, personal commitment, is because the companies think that there is no advance because the consumers are not demanding this kind of goods. But meanwhile, we are in a society where consumption is the drive, then we cannot create a circular economy. The idea of ever-increasing consumption is really crazy. It's uh, driving us to a nightmare. It is not the company's guilt. It's not the citizen's guilt. We just have to change our minds, our mindsets. In traditional societies, People used to work as less as possible and, uh, and use as less energy as possible to, to meet their needs and to sustain their lives. We're going to have a better well-being, feeding people and meeting the needs. 
consuming less or the less possible with the less uh, economic activity possible and less uh, energy consumption level now the priorities are inverted we must consume the most possible our priorities are inverted once we invert these priorities and once we have an economy that is not obsessed with the <clears throat> national gross product but rather on real well-being we will begin to we're gonna try we're gonna focus on the most important which are those things and so losing the match the match is already lost so uh, better collapsing I, I, I really like that <laughs> any more remarks uh, before telling you the results of the online questionnaire Hello, the first I do agree with Margarita about everything she has said. She has perfectly expressed my thoughts. I just would like to add that Kurt, uh, you're a Belgian citizen. Hmm. She said that uh, firms are perfectly aware of the problem, they are researching into that, but my perception is that just uh, a face washing thing. <laughs> then a real modification of the economic system. I see it's complicated because they have to adapt to the uh, consumers demand or expression that I hate on the other hand but some educational uh, job could be done by firms my question is that is it is about the fact that all the campaigns of firms could you invest more time, more money into modifying the consumption patterns of the people because uh, they are exposed to information images most people are exposed to that it, uh, to uh, firms advertising, firms marketing and so it's useful are you investing about that? Are you doing an effort, uh, an effort about that? I would say that yes, maybe in the past uh, there was some greenwashing. I don't think it was really effective because then the consumer doesn't pay attention. But today, big firms are really, really taking climate change seriously. They see it as a threat. They see that something to be integrated into their strategic plans. So big, all big firms that are well managed, they take into account where are they heading to uh, about their energy consumption and are setting themselves very ambitious goals also analyst experts we ourselves that we belong to a sector that has no particularly important ecological footprint if we compare with transportation energy sector most of the questions we receive by analysts have to do with climate change so along these lines we have a 100% renewable goal for uh, 2030. We have uh, renewable plans for the whole company. Once you have the clear idea that this should be uh, part of your strategic plan, you must change the f working of your institution comprehensively. 
about how do we communicate that to our customers we can do things much more better we about a core rating we have made some efforts with not a big impact but we are analyzing many other options for instance what the uh, air travel companies are doing we may introduce in the invoice for the customer how the contribution to emissions by the service we offer we are trying to give more information because the problem is that society has in general more information coming from everywhere um, every firm builds uh, their information f looking at their own interests if I am a customer I want to buy a smartphone through a company like Telefonica Telefonica and Orange have agreed to use eco rating but if you use Vodafone they have a similar system under different standards what should the customer do they don't know how who to trust so when we inform about this same way we buy a, a fridge and knowing we should go for tri triple a there should be a standard simplify the standards in the information the customer gets about these topics and we should gather together more as a sector different firms in order for the information to be consistent uh, reliable and checked by a third actor in this sense i understand that the possibility for the citizens about uh, doing pressure on politicians is weak and the lobbying sector of the corporation is stronger so the role of the copper or the firm should be to force legislation into consider non-economic uh, actions we have this group of firms that gathers together to find uh, answers by the government to things that we see that we have to meet and we want to because from the point of view of a smart uh, uh, entrepreneurial management makes sense because we must reformulate our energy model absolutely but depending on the country we are in it is hard uh, to put governments to work to catch up good morning uh, it's difficult to me because you represent uh, you're searching for solution from industry but you are part of the problem I don't know very well how can you uh, achieve uh, beyond reduction of the minerals we use um, while at the same time you are promoting the continuous exchange of technology your logic is about selling and selling and more the day I will see that a firm has strategic plans about selling less because the product is more durable, I will start to trust your words. Our, sorry, our strategy is not just about selling, it's about also employing people and generated income for those people so they can buy food and live. But the reality is that it is clear that a firm has goals and today a firm that has no growth goals most likely is going to disappear. But that doesn't mean that that firm cannot promote services that are going to help mitigate climate change and Telefonica is already doing that. Uh, mostly in the B2B uh, 
services, fleet management, a, most of the services related to smart cities and so on. And also we must work uh, about our own footprint promoting the uh, communication to consumers, uh, to customers about that and, about, and on them deciding which firm do they choose depending on the ecological footprint they produce. To repeat it, I think that you are part of the problem, not the solution. I think that firms, the bigger they are, they are dinosaurs. You are finishing, you are ending this world. And those who are making changes are the citizens, there is nothing else. You are always lagging behind change, all the strategies, all labs fantastic human resources, but it's the citizens who are making those changes. And as long as firms uh, don't abandon exponential growth and have a light bulb and not having light bulbs during 100 years, you will be a part of the problem and you will not be circular economy, but the circular problem that the world has. I'm not addressing you personally, it's not, it's not personal. No, no, you have absolute right to say what you say. Uh, hopefully what you say is true and is the citizens promoting this change uh, for everybody. It will be good for everybody. Yes, I, I agree with what the uh, colleague said. I think that the key is about the firm model, because as long as uh, firms are into a competition market uh, with the consumer, they want to keep their, uh, their staff, their employees, they need to do activity that many times is not necessary. I think that for the point to be of social and solidarity economy, there are some answers. Producers and uh, consumers uh, cooperatives. If you have an economy, a cooperative formed by producers, consumers and workers at the same time, and say it is into a close uh, realm, consumers are paying for the services that they don't need a firm to produce always more. Uh, producers would want to uh, the firm to produce more, but who is paying them? The consumers and the consumers wouldn't want to uh, spend more uh, spend more resources. This way, you could get to a stationary model, an economy that doesn't produce what they don't need. But as long as we are into these competition economies, we are chained to totally illogical dynamics. I have known some producer-consumers uh, cooperatives, and it's a very interesting dynamic that doesn't need to be growing all the time, but at the same time they are doing things all the time uh, because the consumer spends in unnecessary items, they are not spending in other things. Uh, well, the colleague has made my question, asked my question, and I wanted to ask if there are, if there is any department at Telefonica that doesn't fire employees that doesn't sell enough. Be <laughs> my interpretation of the circular economy, the green economy, green growth, if you see any a MacArthur Foundation documentary, uh, the corporations wanted to manage change. To say that this is not greenwashing, I want to, I, I, it's nothing personal, but the strategy of circular economy and the firms that are behind are those that when you pose a fiscal ecological reform, 
they are in the opposite side against it and pressing uh, governments for a refusal we should be hypocrites uh, telefonica wants to grow we want to grow the best way possible but you shouldn't be selling yourselves as the cha as the champions managing the change from the firms i think that's uh, too bold isn't it i never said that we are going to be the champ the ones leading climate uh, environmental change but we are seeing that we are setting ourselves goals that from the point of view of the government from the point of view of the regulatory framework are very difficult to implement for us but that at the same time our goals should be adequate people should have goals not only related to growth or commercial result but should have principles about responsible businesses uh, uh, sustainability and that's the way we are working at big firms uh, if you set on your employees goals only uh, related to commercial result that's what firms are gonna do and there's gonna be no change firms are doing this many firms are introducing in their um, retribution um, the paying systems incentives uh, along these lines i'm not trying to say that we are the best we are just another actor that now is aware that either they contribute uh, to solve this collaborate about climate change uh, mitigation or we ourselves are gonna have a survival problem so in this sense we are working really about uh, looking for solutions to mitigate climate change i'm not saying that we are the the champions uh, now we're gonna raise hands uh, to more interventions briefly please well facing a new horizon we're gonna face a new horizon with changes where the changes are gonna come changes are stressful and the our reaction to that to those new challenges will make the difference and that's where we should invest in more resilient citizens and communities empowered citizens that could adapt to changes that would be my uh, summary of the problem I, is it true my question is it true that when consumers see that firms are more concerned about their well-being do they start to consume that or this or that firm uh, product have you done that analysis that's what i was saying about echo rating the business case uh, about sustainability is not so clear M there are s many firms uh, working about offering uh, sustainable product in some uh, uh, sectors is uh, growing ecological agriculture cleaning product but in many uh, contacts and many sectors I, we don't see clear that this is gonna mm, return us uh, beneficially because we don't see clear that our promotions of gr more green greener products is gonna is having uh, positive outcomes i would like to ask something from your point of view uh, we were speaking about incentives to change uh, consumer dynamics from the point of view is it feasible a uh, legislative uh, scenario uh, about uh, firms strategic plans in which there are incentives for it degrowth uh, 
a strategy about energy. Could you imagine which incentives uh, there could be? Is it feasible or is it, or doesn't it make sense? Well, uh, we have uh, in our model we have studied the scenarios for climate ch for uh, technological change, and we want to study scenarios of uh, demand reduction. What happens if tomorrow we promote bicycles and we solve transportation? But this is gonna uh, produce, uh, provoke cuts in the automobile uh, industry with effects on employment and so on. I saw we are still working about that. I can't tell you what could happen, but we must take into account that those scenarios maybe help you to adapt to a decrease in energy. So, all, in spite of the fact that some uh, firms could, should be obliged uh, to restructure or even disappear, if not, maybe all of them are going to go to hell. So we're going to do a raising hand sample. There are four options about personal commitments uh, for the next decade. The first would be a, uh, about the startups, uh, my professional career. I, I'm trying to do the best possible. Other would be to commit into processes of uh, severe transition, loving the institutions, loving the firms to celebrate the processes. The third would be locally based revolutions, getting away from institutional conflicts and focusing on transitional communities. And the fourth is uh, preparing for doomsday. I and I will be uh, prepared for that. We're ready. Which uh, scenario do you support? Would you subscribe uh, for A2, for B, about severe transition? Six. C, about um, locally based, uh, community based, uh, as a hope for change. 10 and I'm gonna barricade with my gun and so one and I'm gonna tell you what the people online has uh, uh, answered a couple of hours ago the first result was uh, techno optimism had little support between zero and one of hope in techno optimism. Second scenario, uh, ecological and humanist transition. Uh, most results of the 50 something people about possibilities of uh, environmental uh, imposition, eco fascism. 33 percent thought. It was likely for to 23, 24, 2050, and the collapse scenario, there are two poles. 31% considered there is a considerable risk, and it's divided from a 20% that says that the risk is low. There is this separation between those thinking that it is very likely and those that is less little likely. Here you have chosen a humanist ecologist option, the second option about personal transitions. The online people at 11 a.m. thought that had little uh, hope in techno-optimist uh, solution. Almost a 50% had some hope. The majority are for a severe transition. Another 50% puts more weight about the three, four options. 
uh, lobbying institutions on the market and the, the most uh, supported is defending myself from a likely collapse personally so there are people thinking that you have to defend yourself personally and five is majority 40 percent puts all the weight in on locally based communities and changing system with this uh, it's two o'clock miraculously it's not just a good moderation it's just the event have allowed us to finish in time. Thank you. If you want to uh, answer our questionnaire, it's a little biased because of the sensibilities here in Media Lab. Thank you, Marga Media Villa and her for being here. See you next time. Forms. This morning we had Minister uh, Tejerina, the Mayor and the European Commissioner in order to discuss among different cities and this institution about our challenges. And now comes the time for a last part, which is a call to <laughs> promoters from all the world. Um, and after the prototype, after the projects, uh, we search for people wanting to build the prototypes here, and we have made a call throughout the European Union for projects about uh, these issues uh, throughout the European Union. And I'm going to call you to the floor in order. The first is Jorge Aguado. Uh, by the ocean, we unite uh, the struggle against plastic, Jorge uh, Gelscape is about a mass spectrometer, national urban lightning measurement. A mass spectrometer allows to detect pollution. Who is Jack? The third is from uh, Marai streaming is about citizen science coming from Marai. And the fourth comes from the Basque country, Uleakov Collective, about uh, the recovery of urban space from the environmental and citizens' participation point of view. Without not Jorge Aguado, if you kindly want to start uh, your presentation. Before starting, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I would like to ask you here, how many of you have you used a plastic bottle this last month? We are many people. I, will, I want to give you some news. Some days ago, I picked up your plastic bottles, not yours, but May, one of the many thousands that you have in the ocean. I'm Jorge. I come from the Foundation by the Ocean We Unite. We are an, uh, a foundation from the Netherlands, and we are working about plastic pollution and about how to raise awareness uh, among politicians about this pl plastic problem, which is an everyday problem, and today is not something from the past is something from uh, that is present and will be always in the future but it's doing is being harmful enough by now by the ocean we not we started some years ago with thomas there in the middle of the photo thomas is a professional skipper he was shipping through the ocean and one day uh, looking at the large uh, sea, he found not fish but a plastic bottle. What is this doing here in the middle of the ocean that nobody is using? 
this plastic pollution led him to think what he could do to change that. Uh, by the way, the bottle is one of the logos of our foundation. Then he, he came back to the Netherlands and we, together with a group of people that wanted to join the cause, he created this foundation that I will of which I will speak to you uh, later. And here I come, I myself, I ask myself, what can I do? When we are young, we want to swallow the world from the top. I have always had that uh, leaning towards uh, the environment, I'm going to call Greenpeace or Ecologistas in Acción, I present them uh, my work, but there is no room for everybody. So uh, I was working for the European Commission uh, together, precisely together. The, the commissioner was here. I work as a scientific communication uh, uh, research. I did some training about recycling and waste art, and I had the chance to meet by the ocean we unite they were so they had such a hospitality and wanted somebody to help them with communication i say why not and i have learned that from the local you can always uh, attain the global sphere and today it's a pleasure to be with you why plastic well, plastic, since uh, 1950, there is an increase of 300%. Uh, it's not that uh, we hate plastic, it's the way we use them. We use it, we recycle very little, as you can see in the chart. We recycle 36% uh, in the European Union and 18% uh, in the United States. Just want to give you uh, daily data. In the United States, they use uh, some 500 million drinking straws. In the this bottle here, we use it at home and then we throw it for recycling. So it's not the the blame of the citizens, that bottle many times ends up in the sea, it gets to the bottom, or it is uh, eaten by fishes, and this is another problem. The microplastic and nanoplastic, they decompose, plastic decomposes uh, in the large sea, or it's decomposed, the uh, end of the problem. No, the problem is still there, because microplastics are really dangerous, because they end in the uh, in the sea phone. This is an endless cycle that the Lion King says. And bad news, you have plastic in your body, myself too. The food chain, the nutrition chain, you see fishes and mammals and then ends in our body. Sorry for the bad news, I don't like it. How do we work at By the Ocean? We work uh, on different projects. Uh, among them, we started with knowledge, with uh, awareness of the politicians and the, and the citizens, and then offering uh, solutions. Uh, through cooperation, because, because we think that this is a community, we must help each other and we must look uh, together for solutions. And here comes our field work I'm going to uh, speak to you about. We do uh, some expeditions from our base in the Netherlands, we hire ships and we invite citizens, politicians, scientists, lots of people. In my case, when I 
had the chance to know by the ocean we unite. I had an expedi four hour expedition with a high representative of European youth. Well, that was uh, good news because uh, a higher representative will know something about that so we can promote uh, policies to end with plastics. You may know that the uh, European Commission is catching up about this issue and Pipperman uh, made public the new policy about plastic reduction. What do we do with the ships? We go in the large uh, sea and we throw a, a network, which is like a fishing uh, network, and we uh, collect, we fish uh, plastics and microplastics. There you, you can see what comes after 20 minutes. We clean everything and with that sample we pick them up we clean it and we collect the little uh, waste and we classify from little to uh, bigger. There is everything. <clears throat> As you can see, we classify and then this <clears throat> goes to a second branch, which is, which is uh, research. We take, we bring that to the lab to the lab this is rose that in the netherlands he looks deeper into the samples cleans them and after that we look through the microscope to see what we find and nine nine of ten fishes has plastics inside what what do we do with this sample? We send them to five jars. They have more uh, powerful uh, machines and they can look more into detail about what would we find. Funny thing is that the app, the upper photo in one of those cans, the white thing is a ship. Uh, Greece, uh, they use it and in the large sea they throw it, but that uh, substance does not dissolve, it goes into the fishes, it goes to our beaches and beaches and to uh, clean it is very difficult. We could pick it up and it's into the samples too. Uh, we also give talks, we go to schools, to firms, to businesses, to many places to tell the story by the ocean. We unite uh, and we, that's a message. The lesser we use, the better. We do uh, cleanups in beaches, uh, beach uh, cleanup. Mm. Every, so every time you go to the beach, you can collect every plastic you see in five minutes. Five minutes you can fill, fill in a bag and, and, and put it in the garbage can. We also have several projects, not just in the Netherlands. Uh, currently, Thomas, one of the founders in, is in Croatia, because uh, there is the Silva project. We have organized uh, together with other foundations to create one of the first ecological islands in the world. They are dis now discussing there, but also enjoying the beach. Not is work is not everything. This is top secret. We also have the Balkans project that I'm uh, directing. It's a route, 13 days uh, route through Kosovo and Albania uh, for the environment and peace. I hope to make it in August, next August, and after that we're going to create a strategy of communication 
trying to involve different actors to change uh, awareness by the people. Uh, what can I do? What can you do? Same question I made myself in the past. It seems simple, but change life habits is very complicated to go to a disco and say no to a straw. It seems easy, but many times they are already there. I want to offer you those solutions for you to apply them. They seem easy, but they need awareness. Reusable bags, using cups. Uh, I, I bring my cup to the cafeteria and say, can you put my coffee there? And then you can clean it up. Uh, many times, uh, I, I have seen this morning that in Greece there is people looking for discounts in coffee shops if you bring your own cup. Those are solutions that we can offer to our politicians, to our friends. It's about uh, talking, look, my own bottle, uh, five euros and it's always with me. We must act, act up and change a little thing in our life to help the environment. After that we have a lots of uh, communities, some are here because there are so many, there are many people involved, leaders of change, even our own grandmother uh, can become an activist. And here are several people that struggles for the plastic. One solution is to live without... Uh, I, these people, I knew them in a meeting and they have decided to live a zero waste life. They don't create any plastic waste. It's a self improvement story. They are so nice, you should go see them. And, and I want to show you one of the videos by the Ocean We Unite did. Uh, we were invited to the World Ocean Summit in Mexico and we had the chance to tell a story, not myself. I stayed here in Madrid and I want to share it with you. climate change and the need for climate action. Now we need to understand ocean change and the need for ocean action. It's not something that an individual, a responsible individual should shirk. Every second breath you take comes from the life within the ocean. And we cannot be in a state of uh, denial. Uh, skepticism is the essence of all science. Denial is not. In, in the time that I've been around, I've seen the, the ocean decline. I mean, seriously decline. Changing the temperature, changing the chemistry of the ocean, depleting the wildlife, and the collapse of whales. We generally stopped killing whales and they've started to recover. We haven't stopped killing tuna and they're not. They're going like this. We need to act in, against, immediately against the fishing institution in Mexico that is Cona Pesca because they've been doing it pretty bad since the 1950s until nowadays. Jacques Cousteau named it the Aquarium of the World in the late 80s and if we don't do something extremely accurate it will turn into a cemetery, marine cemetery. Start today. Skip the straw. Say no to single-use plastic. Every action counts. There isn't um, a small action. The small action contribute to something bigger. Do something. Anything will help at this point. <laughs> Do you have children? Do you 
Do you care about the world that your children are going to grow up in? Obviously, as an owner of a big corporation, your children will be okay, but don't you want to make them proud and have them know that you've made a difference in the world and not just increased your own worth? Con esto, acabar diciendo que, bueno... Well, let's take care of what we have, let's act up, let's give the chance to the youth and, and the elderly to be the leaders of change, at least be the avant-garde of the future without plastic with this. Thank you. My 15 minutes are over. Any question is welcome. Thank you. Alguna pregunta? Any questions? Do you have any questions? I have a doubt about what do you do with the plastic after you collect them? Uh, don't you think don't they lose their properties because of salt, because of the sun? Do they degrade? Please can you uh, when plastic are in the sea, they degrade, and what do you do with them after you pick them up? Well, they do degrade, of course. The sand affects a lot to plastic. They are um, degradable, but they remain dissolved. You don't see the plastic back, but they get dissolved. So, they are there in the water. And they end that in the food chain, in ourselves, in the animals. The second question, what do you do with the plastic you collect? We uh, pick uh, small plastic, our net, fishing network is small, and everything goes to the labs. If we collect bigger pieces, they go to recycling. We would like to collect all plastic in the ocean. There are many uh, ideas about that, but I think it's imp almost impossible to uh, collect all plastic actually in the oceans. There are some eight trillions, eight trillion tons of plastic in the ocean. Hello, I would like to ask, uh, I don't know, it's a urban legend about a plastic continent drifting away in the ocean. There is, indeed, there is the sixth continent. It is an island, it's, a, it's almost a country in the middle of the Atlantic, and I was reading a scientific survey and it was as big as Spain, France and Germany together in the middle of the ocean, so you can imagine. When we do beach uh, cleanup in Thailand, it's brutal. You just have to walk in the streets from my home until here. I have found anything, everything, just uh, fixing my look. We must act up and we must be the leaders of this change. This uh, thing about the plastic island, I understood that island wasn't uh, the exact term. Uh, it's uh, rather like a sort of soup in a mixed uh, area of water and, and plastic. Maybe, hopefully we're never there. This island is enormous, it's, but because of the maritime, maritime uh, flows, it keeps moving. So there is a huge amount of plastic, not just in the Atlantic, it's up, east, west, north, south. They 
get together, then they divide, they separate. You know, that story of the sinking ship and then the uh, ducks uh, emerging and going to the coast. And But this is uh, not ducks, it's bottles, it's uh, bags, it's <laughs> and many of it goes to the bottom of the sea. And there are surveys that show that. I would like to ask you two things. One is from the walks uh, you were speaking, the ship walks, is to reduce friction uh, in the ship. What do they use it for? I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say. I think it's uh, because to get out of the docks. Do you also use walks in, in your ship? This is a rather technical question. I wouldn't lie to you if I don't know. We uh, hire ships uh, that we have already used once, and we try to do the more in the most ecological way possible. I would say no, but I can assure you. Uh, I don't know if you have seen the great prototype we have, the Eco boat uh, downwards. I saw the video you, of the probe you did in the Retiro Park. Please, if you have another, please let me see. We're going to see. It's recyclable, isn't it? I have no questions because what you have told, um, I don't know how large is the ocean, but this is the big part of the world, international waters that ne nobody takes care of. So thank you to you and other people who are taking care of the sea, be it animals. And it's the same maybe in when you do some diving in the beach, you get scared of what you see, so figure yourself in the deep sea. Uh, I would encourage people because it's easy, but having to, we shouldn't use plastic. It's not about recycling. We should stop using them. We should stop recycling it. Stop using plastic, refusing the straw, refusing plastic bottles, and so on. All the other projects uh, with, the, with the Struders, the project of Interactivo with the Struders. So, Thank you for the conscious or the awareness. Many times I have felt frustrated because I, I have thought the world is crumbling. We are already in a plastic world. Are we going to make it because the political plans 2050? But for that time, climate change will be at full throttle. But I, at the same time, I know people like Plastic Foundation, Bubble Barrier, Plastic Subsurfer. I have had the chance to know lots of groups that make you regain hope. There are so many people working about it, working on that, that it encourages you. We are plastic consumers. You buy some vegetables, some fruit, bags everywhere. Uh, there is hope. Hopefully we can refuse all plastics, zero percent. Hopefully. Uh, I Myself, I try every day. I refuse uh, uh, the glasses. I, I, I know people that would use machines, uh, uh, but use their own glass in, in bending machines. So I invite you to change that chip in your mind and start saying, how can I change things?
uh, not that good. Uh, well, thank you for this uh, lovely presentation and the subject uh, that you work on. Uh, I do have a question uh, regarding uh, what do you see as the source of uh, plastic? And then I mean, um, do you see the seashore as a source of plastic? Or you see that the rivers are also a source for plastic? Both of them. Um, bueno, responde en inglés o en español? I will re respond in English. Both of them are the problem. You are coming from Netherlands, as I know, and in Netherlands the problem is not about the seashore only, but because of the canals, the plastic, uh, as I said before, is not only the problem of the population, but it's so overcrowded with the tourism that sometimes the garbage is full and then the bottle falls down into the canal and because there's no very good cleanup sometimes, the bottle goes through the sea and it goes to the ocean. And the problem is in both sides. It's not only, yeah, sorry. And uh, does your organization also uh, focus on uh, that part of the source, like uh, telling about rivers and teaching about rivers? Yeah, yeah, sure. We are from the Netherlands, so of course canals are in everywhere, it's everywhere, so we need to also take care of this. We, uh, besides this, we use uh, big ships, so mostly it's on the sea of the, the Netherlands and outside, because we do big expeditions, like this year is going to Denmark. Um, but yeah, of course, it's the same problem. The problem uh, we fight is plastic pollution. So it doesn't matter even, like the project of the Balkans is at, in the mountains. So what we say is we don't only hike the, I mean, we don't only sail the oceans, but we also hike the mountains. Okay, it's good to hear. Uh, I would love to invite you um, to co uh, collaborate uh, together because we own this uh, project uh, for rivers, mm -hmm. for fish migration and plastic migration. So uh, together we can... Uh, sure. Any collaboration, as I say, we need to make community out of this. So yeah. welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Alguna más? Any more questions? Uh, a month ago, we did a meeting about circular economy. We had a firm from Valencia, CM Plastic. They had a project, I don't know if you know it. They are paying uh, fishers from Barcelona for the plastic they meet, and they, they extrude them to do so-called plastic boot. It's not high quality, but this kind of plastic extrusions can be made with uh, mixes of 30% uh, straw uh, and that structure could perfectly uh, last for 50 years. So there are chances to do extrusion uh, in the docks. I read something, if I remember well, do they do some, some plastic wires? Uh, but that's it. Uh, there are so many people and hopefully this uh, keeps growing because currently we use lots of plastic and with so thank you for the news because those are the kind of ideas that can lead us to reach more people and change more things. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to Media Lab. And thank you to the European Commission, to any doubt, question. You have my Twitter. I'm very active. So whatever you need, or by Facebook. Thanks a lot. Jail. Jail.
Okay, uh, well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jelle Kabbes. Uh, I'm a teacher of geography uh, from the Netherlands and I also uh, work for GLOBE. Um, and before I go into this subject, I would love to present what GLOBE is about. Uh, are there people familiar with GLOBE? Yes, yeah, some people are. Okay, it's the worldwide um, network education program of NASA. And uh, it's, uh, it has, uh, it's especially for schools. Um, it's 30 in 33,000 schools in more than 120 countries worldwide. And uh, we develop citizen science projects uh, focusing on envir environmental, uh, nature kind of projects, um, especially for students. And students are mostly uh, between 8 to 15 or 16 years old, uh, so our future generation. And um, well, the subject that, um, that uh, Jorge, is uh, the right pronunciation, yes, um, just presented, um, is really interesting, I think, for, for the next generation to hear as well. So uh, I hope uh, your project's also focusing on how to reach uh, children. Um, GLOBE in Spain has 334 schools, I looked it up this morning, but uh, they don't have any um, country coordinator recent at this, at this moment, which is a shame because that's the, the one that really activates all the schools to, uh, to be involved and to make new projects. So this might be a good venue to, uh, to, uh, to ask people um, to present themselves to go as a, um, a project coordinator for Spain. So, um, I do this for, uh, for the Netherlands, uh, together with, uh, with a couple of other uh, people which are really enthusiastic about it as well. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for uh, inviting me here. Um, my uh, project is about uh, how sustainable um, is the lighting in your neighborhood. It's a school project. Uh, for citizen science, um, we use it for geography or uh, science students. Um, we always try, uh, when you were in my class, I would always uh, try to motivate you and to see if you are uh, curious about the subject. And so we first uh, try to activate your curiosity. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, it doesn't start the video in here, uh, so I have to switch to YouTube, which I will do right now. I have to give the shout outs for this video, because this video is made by my students. Um, the names will be in the subtitles as well, and uh, I, I promise them to give a shout out uh, to them, and uh, thank you guys for this. Um, uh, they show this project and they don't answer every question you get of, of this project. I will do that later on. But I hope it really um, activates your curiosity about this uh, project. So just for my students, well, because I will uh, uh, l uh, show this to, to them, uh, could you give them applause for making this? <laughs> uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, th this is a good way to, uh, to, to activate them and to, uh, to make like a sort of tutorial for our project. We show this to other schools and to students from other schools uh, to motivate them to, to join the project. Um, and I will go to this slide. So this is always the first uh, slide that I show to my students uh, how many times more durable uh, a LED light is uh, when you compare it to the, uh, to the old school uh, light bulb. And, um, it's a 33 times more durable than uh, uh, the, the old school lights that's being used. Um, uh, I always give them a, a quiz as well because uh, my students always love quizzes. It activates them, it motivates them. And uh, I would like to do that with you as well. So, uh, hands up if you think, uh, I will show you four different places which are artificially lit. And it's up to you to choose uh, the one you think is the most artificially lit place on earth. So, is this uh, Schipluide? This is a small village in, uh, in the Netherlands. Is it uh, Las Vegas in the United States? Is it Hong Kong? Or is it Madrid? So, who says Schipluide? No. Who says Las Vegas? So one, two, three, four, five, okay. Who says Hong Kong? One, two, three. Okay, uh, Madrid, okay, I love this, because uh, it's always nice to, to show uh, something you wouldn't expect, but Schipluid is famous for its greenhouses, and they are really, um, it's, it's a real lit area, and it's, uh, famous for being the most lit area uh, in the world. Uh, you wouldn't expect it, but uh, then it uh, also shows um, uh, the urgency to, to cooperate and to join uh, the project from my students. Uh, this is the uh, National Live Measurement. Uh, you saw the video, uh, I already told you it would uh, give you some questions and I hope to, uh, uh, to answer them um, already. Uh, okay, so students, uh, they can choose. They can choose uh, make it your own um, spectroscope or we have this building kind of project uh, which they think it's fun to do. Uh, this is uh, sponsored by some companies which are into uh, lighting and uh, they hope to uh, see uh, students are enthusiastic about what they do and uh, the next uh, generation uh, of uh, light bulb makers to motivate them to, uh, to how to use instruments for that. Uh, well, as uh, as soon as they um, um, as soon as they have this uh, spectroscope finished, they will go on the streets and uh, go uh, uh, in, into the the, uh, the streets in the residential streets of uh, uh, near our school during night time, um, and you can see uh, the four different kind of spectrums which will be visible in your sp uh, spectroscope. So it's quite easy. Uh, it's uh, really hands-on, it's, uh, um, it's for students uh, easy to make and uh, they think it's fun to do and uh, that's one of the most important things uh, for education. Uh, it needs to be fun but it also has to have a good purpose. Uh, they go on the streets and uh, they, uh, they collect their data and uh, when they're back at school uh, we open the computers and we have this um, uh, visualizing um, uh, GIS uh, in, uh, environment where they can put into the, in the data and up right after that it will show uh, with, um, with colors how durable and which kind of lightning is used by, uh, by the residents in, uh, in those streets. Uh, for them it's really important to see something is really visual, so uh, data entry is not one of the most popular things with, uh, with, uh, with my students, but uh, when it becomes visible uh, right away, they, uh, they are interested in it. Uh, one of the other important parts is, uh, of citizen science, I think, is uh, you have to, uh, they have to have a feeling that they're doing it for somebody else as well. 
and they have to have uh, an, a professional feedback. So this is the second video that I wanted to show you. I will put on uh, the top titles. Hoi, ik ben uh, Marieke Stolk. Ik werk bij Milieu Centraal. Wij zijn een uh, voorlichtingsorganisatie over energie en milieu in het uh, dagelijks leven. En via onze website geven we mensen uh, praktische tips hoe ze rekening kunnen houden met milieu en uh, energie kunnen besparen. Kloop Nederland heeft mij gevraagd om naar de gegevens te kijken van de nationale lichtmeting. En als ik daarnaar kijk zie ik dat er 13.000 waarnemingen zijn geweest. Dat is echt heel erg goed, dat is top. En wat ook wel leuk is dus om te zien is dat het aantal gloeilampen sinds 2015 in de huizen is gedaald. Van 30% in 2015 naar 27% in 2017. Dus dat is een mooie daling. En ledlampen zijn juist gestegen van uh, bijna 30% in 2015 naar 37% in uh, 2017. Het is natuurlijk een uh, positieve ontwikkeling dat er steeds meer uh, led in de Nederlandse huizen komt uh, te hangen. Want ledlampen zijn veel zuiniger dan vloeilampen. Ze besparen zo'n 85% op de stroom. En uh, gezien het feit dat er dus nog zo'n 25% gloeilampen in de huizen hangen, ja, is er nog een hele hoop besparingspotentieel in Nederland. En het zou natuurlijk heel goed zijn om daar uh, een campagne op te gaan voeren, om mensen op te roepen om al die gloeilampen te vervangen door ledlampen. Het is goed voor het milieu, maar ook heel goed voor je eigen portemonnee. So by showing this to uh, students, uh, they really feel that uh, they are uh, noticed. What what they uh, what they researching, what they're doing is uh, noticed uh, from from um, outside of the school as uh, as well. Uh, this is one of the main thing that uh, that uh, Globe uh, thinks is really important. Uh, what you study, what you research, must be real for students. It's a, one of the most motivating points for, uh, for students. Um, I will go on to the, to the next slide in the meanwhile. Um, okay, uh, not just uh, wanting to show you uh, the success of uh, the project, because uh, we had a lot of uh, measurements taken, it's quite, quite okay. Uh, but we still see some improvements to be made. Uh, we'd love it to have uh, an app developer or a web developer which is capable of showing year-to-year -year differences. So our students can see the development of uh, um, uh, durable lightning in the, the streets uh, year by year. Um, we want them to launch uh, a campaign uh, to really um, go to the residents and ask them, okay, did you know you can save a lot of money by using uh, a different kind of light? But it also has a lot of uh, limitations to the project. It's not just a success story. I always want to be uh, straight uh, to you and uh, I think uh, we can approve on this uh, part. Um, well, as, as soon people start to save money, um, you will see an increase of uh, using uh, some of these products. So what you see is um, there is an increased use of, um, of lightning in the Netherlands. So once it's cheap, people are using it more. So that really um, showed us that we have to show them the to grow awareness of this effect. Another effect which we cannot uh, ignore, this one, is that LED light is uh, far more brighter and once it's uh, used even more, so increased use of lightning, uh, it, um, it's polluting the sky. So uh, sky night pollution. So this uh, it gives us some new goals for our proje project to, uh, to, add, to add it to our project and one of those things is um, 
Uh, we want to uh, grow awareness of light pollution, effect on the biodiversity, um, and uh, from cheaper to smarter, and decrease unnecessary lightning. And uh, I always hope uh, that being in venues like this with a lot of people and uh, people on the internet watching it as well, um, we are looking for like uh, the, the map of map or app developers which can help us out with this um, development of this app. Uh, we want to uh, go, uh, go out with our students uh, with an app uh, with photos on it and they can uh, make pictures of places that are unnecessarily lit. And if you can put that in a map situation, you can go to the policy makers of the cities and tell them uh, these areas uh, really need to have a focus on a light policy. So I certainly hope uh, this uh, helps to find uh, people like that. Uh, let's make it the International Light Measurement Project. This is uh, a project which is now Dutch, but uh, it's easily uh, uh, been exportable, I think. Um, what are we looking for? International, uh, so the map now is uh, the environment uh, for in the mapping structures right now is just for the Netherlands. We'd like to make it bigger and, uh, for Europe. We want to make year-to-year -year mapping options. We're looking for schools and cities that want to join. Um, so there are 334 globe schools in, uh, in Spain. So I see a lot of potential uh, for, uh, for Spain as well to join this, and uh, even uh, um, abroad from, uh, from Spain. We're looking for funding partners to, uh, to make the educa educational uh, development better, the application of uh, all the um, GIS uh, development, and to upscale it to an international project for sustainable uh, cities. So I hope uh, that will help. Um, Jorge, uh, I just told you um, uh, there's also a river project run by uh, GLOBE. And this is it. Um, uh, we're looking for a globe. We are connecting globe schools along the Rhine to do um, to do research on water quality, on biodiversity, fish migration, and plastic migration. Um, we are building up this uh, this uh, group of uh, schools. Now we have uh, about 12 schools from the Dutch deltas all the way up to the Swiss Alps. Uh, all globe schools and uh, used to follow protocols doing their, uh, their research. Um, we hope to find schools within a range of 10 kilometers of the Rhine and the side rivers and um, to measure, uh, to share, to compare, to explore the, the region of the, of the Rhine and also visit each other's countries and schools. Um, we hope that it um, motivates them to reach out to each other uh, beyond borders and so from the Netherlands go to, Swiss, to Switzerland and from the Swiss students they go to the Netherlands. Um, we, I would love to see uh, coming out of uh, presentations like this uh, that people contact me if they have any ideas, uh, just your ID by uh, fishermen, paying fishermen to collect plastic out of the rivers. These are the ideas that's uh, worth to come to Madrid, uh, I think. Uh, it's small ideas, but uh, really uh, adjustable for a, for a project like this. Um, so anybody who's, uh, who's got interesting ideas for um, uh, water management, digital mapping, app development, please contact me um, at this uh, email addresses that, um, that I pointed out here. Um, I just wanted to make uh, uh, use of the opportunity uh, besides the National Light Measurement Project to, to present this as well and uh, hope uh, to, um, to see something coming out of it. Um, well, this was my presentation about the National Light Measurement and uh, the River uh, Project. Um, thank you for your attention and uh, thanks again for, uh, for having me here. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. This isn't so much a question as a comment on taking advantage to advertise a project. I don't know about any of you. 
Otherwise, you can use. Hello? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to take advantage of this moment to advertise and maybe suggest uh, Globe has another project um, um, monitoring mosquito larvae. And this is part of a global effort called Global Mosquito Alert that will be coming online. And it also, um, we want to encourage more schools all around the world to start using this protocol as well. Might not be as important in the Netherlands, but um, in Spain, for sure. <laughs> well, it's uh, really nice that you're saying this because, yes, the, the Habitat Mosquito Mapper, this is uh, the project of GLOBE. Uh, it's a good project and especially interesting for the Netherlands as well because uh, last year there were the Asian tiger uh, mosquito and it was uh, located in the Netherlands by using uh, the citizen science app and uh, directly uh, uh, policy makers came uh, into action because of this citizen science project. So uh, yeah, the mosquito habitat mapper and there are a lot of more projects from uh, GLOBE that are really interesting. So uh, again, um, uh, join uh, this GLOBE movement and I hope somebody from Spain will, uh, will um, uh, take the responsibility for being uh, the project manager for, uh, for Spain because uh, it, uh, from what I know, it's, it's still open. Okay, any more questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. We go on with uh, making sense, citizen science. Well, thank you for those of you who have stayed. The sun is shining, there's beer. Are you are you living? Vale, bueno, un poquito atrás. Okay. Vale, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Good evening. Thank you for staying. We're going to do things in Petit Comité. If there are questions right in the middle of my talk, you can raise your hand, no problem. My work is more rather about data and about the way this data can have the capacity of becoming in a great level for change. <laughs> what we have seen throughout the years doing citizen science is that when citizens have a problem, that problem, if they have data, is uh, considered a perception by the institutions. But when the citizens have data, evidence, the power game, the power rules change. And the project I'm going to share with you now, we have been able to introduce an article in the Kosovo Constitution that allows the citizens to know data about the pollution or to transform uh, humidity in houses or transforming as public squares. So citizens of powerman with the great capacity of data, you know that precisely today uh, uh, the protection data bill at the European level is acting. 
is operative. They recognize uh, the right to control our data and the right to uh, of portability of data. I'm going to do a, sh a short parenthesis here because that changed everything. These things could potentially change everything. We could decide that with the data Facebook has about us and a psychology team, we could research many problems about diseases of mind uh, diseases. Microsoft Research has an algorithm that detects following a pregnant woman during six months and uh, after the eighth month uh, detects more than 80% uh, probability if there is a possibility of postpartum depression. The data about us when it's, it is combined with other data and interpreted is impressive. We, we don't have those data, but with, the, with this device we want to have them. We, uh, when we analyze the data, everything changes. But what happens about environmental issues? We follow the Rio Declaration point 10 that recognizes our right to access to data, but not a right to produce data. When we do citizen science, what do experts about that? The same they would do in 2001 when we would use Wikipedia, because they tell you how to do it. So in order to really uh, be able to push a citizen's revolution through data, we must be able to have our right to produce that uh, recognized. And the role of public institutions would be to ensure a possibility to contrast uh, data, to improve the quality of our sensors. If we, this would happen, uh, our power to produce innovation would be just uh, enormous. There are three things you can do in the environmental field. First, increase uh, the existing database. You here in Madrid, you have official measurements uh, about uh, quality, but those measurements are an average of different measurement stations that are strategically placed. I, know, I don't want to talk about the Madrid case, this was a scandal about the placing, the location of those stations. So there has been controversy about that. So many times citizens say, I want to know the quality, the air quality in my neighborhood, in my street. And if you don't have an environmental measurement station, in some times they are placed in a non-polluted area, but the normal uh, citizen lives surrounded by vehicles, uh, etc. Many times citizen science project, uh, citizens generated data want to uh, augment any existing database. Our experience in Pristina, Kosovo, one of the worst uh, quality places in Europe, we do we did a contrast uh, with official data. So the citizens movement uh, tried to collect data, and they once they proved that this was uh, a contradiction with official data, then the strategy is different because who is right? In the third case, uh, we can generate a new data set. This is the project we did in Bristol, that is that green toad is a temperature and humidity sensor that with an algorithm allows us to detect whether you have humidity in your home whether it comes from condensation or from existing humidity. If you have a humidity, is 
if the house is rented, whose responsibility is to fix it? Did you know that it's the owner who must do it? Nobody knows. If you live with humidity in a in a house in a rented house and you are able to prove that it's not condensation you produce but structural humidity affecting your health, the owner should fix it. It doesn't happen because there is no data, but when you have data to the to prove it, like we did in Bristol, when you cross those data with the uh, property uh, register, you can cross data and uh, request uh, the owner's responsibility. So you can do more things. It is important to do to think about this because you can conceptualize a citizen science program and know what to do. Contrast data, cross data. Some years ago, we started this Making Sense European project that wanted to create protocols, technology, and methodologies that would allow us to have these uh, citizens uh, generate data didn't have to come from schools or institutions. We wanted to create uh, the first tool uh, of uh, citizen sensorization to have emerging communities, neighborhood communities that are fed up with acoustic pollution in their neighborhood. What do we do? They complain, but since they don't have data, they have no evidence, so nothing happens. So Making Sense wanted to explore how open source, open source technology and Fab Labs can help communities to create uh, technologies and methodologies to make this possible. We develop also a framework to work with communities, and I'm only going to describe you. Uh, presentation is in English because otherwise the rest of the people <laughs> everybody is understanding me the most important to know about this framework is that the first thing that we do to generate participation is to identify problems that affect communities Many times uh, citizen science begins with the question posed by scientists or municipalities and then they try to look for people that can contribute with data and then they complain about the lack of participation. We started uh, identifying problematics that could interest citizens. And, and then we plan together with citizens the experience uh, the sensorization uh, fast phase begins, then the awareness phase, and then an action is planned because data alone won't solve anything. You have to act with data, and we're going to see some examples. With the Making Sense project, we did nine pilots, ten in Kosovo, three in the Netherlands, and three in Spain. On the basis of the work with communities through this pilot project, we developed the first open source cool toolkit for uh, sensor, citizen sensorization and citizen methodology. Now I'm going to tell you about one uh, pilot to see how this everything mixes, uh, combines into a project that allows citizens to act on reality and solve local problems. Whoever has been in, who has been in Barcelona knows the Plaza del Sol. Can you tell us what happens? Why, what is so characteristic, so typical of the Plaza del Sol? Plaza del Sol is famous because since for 20 years it's been the meeting point for a collective drinking, Botellón is a beautiful square in the Gracia neighborhood in Barcelona and has physical, urbanistic uh, characteristics that produce a situation of a very particular Botellón situation. 
since it is empty, has no urban furniture, some 700, 800 people can gather there to drink. And in the last uh, in the late years, a parking was built underneath uh, and they built a platform for Botellón that projects uh, noise uh, affecting neighborhood much more. There is no green barrier, some a few, a few uh, trees, but the windows are over, just over uh, the square. And the neighbors are complaining about it but they always said that it was a perception, just a perception. So, through the identification of problematics in Barcelona, we got to the uh, neighborhood association. Here you have people from 5 to 70 years that uh, are really stressed because they feel that this is happening for years and nothing changes. We work with 50 neighbors about uh, acoustic pollution. It is important to know that noise is not just uh, a disturbing thing. When people call and denounce uh, is that noise, being suffering noise, noise level is really bad for the health, insomnia, stress, even diabetes or cardiovascular problems. Sometimes uh, we speak a lot about air pollution, but noise pollution seems to be less harmful. But we know always more about the uh, terrible uh, result, terrible consequences for health. We use a sensor, a smart city kit that was created in the Barcelona Fab Lab, that has its problems uh, together with the communities following participative design protocols, we improve the design of the sensor for two purposes, to be more reliable, to have robust data, how it should be installed, and two, we identified that there were people buying it and wasn't able to link it to the internet. So we created a new installation kit that eases it a lot and allows for anybody to use it. It costs some 100, 120 years and is Arduino compatible. The small box is open source, uh, you can change it according to the measurement. This is for noise measurement and you can make it through any 3D printer. We installed 25 sensors in the square, in the windows, and other sensors inside. We wanted to gather data from the acoustic pollution in the square, but also uh, from the noise inside the apartments. And we also use this, uh, these books, sensing notes, uh, that allow you to know, to jot down data. You have to jot down data. I need to know whether the window was open or closed, if it had double glass or not, if the TV set was on or not. To interpret data, you need notes, because uh, <laughs> You can build. You can't build a data set without that. <laughs> During six weeks, continuous six weeks, we gather data about acoustic pollution every five seconds. So, imagine a very complete data set. This would allow us to measure different things, in particular how noise behaves throughout the day. All this was important because we needed to prove or not the neighbors complaint. Then, in a collaborative way, we developed some methodologies uh, for the communities to understand uh, and uh, come to conclusions. Because many times we get the data and then they go to the blackbirds and then we tell the neighbors. But this means that Myself, as the scientist, I, wrote, I 
write my paper and I'm not interested in that anymore, these people is not going to be able to do it themselves. So it was very important for us to guarantee the sustainability of these protocols. So a lot of time was invested in data collection and interpretation. They would have uh, real-time feedback. These are Joan and René that when they started to see real-time data, they said, here I have the evidence. So they felt uh, always more empowered. Now, then we know we know how to prove it. To generate a community awareness, we created a data observatory. This observatory allowed to see, you see that we have some 29 connected sensors, 10 those in green are giving, uh, are transmitting data, the others not. Because the citizens, uh, they had the power, the capacity to switch on and off the sensors. Because these sensors could register, uh, 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 you know, private noises and you don't want everybody to know. So they have the possibility to manage uh, the workings of the sensors. Those centilla noise are the public sensors. We discovered that the municipality had official sensors and since I knew that they were going to attack me saying those are not official sensors, so we in integrated the official sensors into our data set. So they couldn't argue that those were an official sensors. And if you look at both uh, kind of sensors, you see there is no difference. What do data say in the Plata del Sol? A totally uh, normal situation. Uh, when at six o'clock, the noise decreases, but in our Plata del Sol it increases after six in the evening and the most noisy hours are the nightly hours and between 21 and 7 a.m. we have the in the night we have the biggest concentration of noise with the, which days uh, Botellón behavior from Wednesday to uh, Sunday morning. And do you know what the uh, European Directive says about the limits to acoustic uh, pollution? 35 uh, decibels in the night. What do we have here? We have a constant over 60 and 60 with peaks that get to 100 decibels in a logarithmic scale. 70 is not the double of 35, it's much more. What does the health, World Health Organization says that those noise level destroys your health? And these people have been living for many years with those noise level. Three nights a week they can sleep, the rest it is impossible. With this data, citizens, they felt always more empowered, they had evidence, and they created some uh, initiatives like the Botellón Don't Let Me Sleep, and in their complaints to the urban police, they would uh, write the data. They make it to the media, to TV, and we realized that uh, we should be able to co-create a solution between those who use the square and those who suffer the square. So a big uh, citizen's assembly was uh, organized and they co-created possible solutions to be sent to the municipality. Three of them uh, changing the hours uh, for cleaning the square, so uh, now when they come for the botellón everything is wet so it's not so uh, attractive. 
then an awareness awareness uh, campaign there are many tourists there in Grazia we want to live, we like to sleep, to dream and then in those uh, steps now there are some uh, bushes and and some gardening and now they are uh, negotiating a children's park so to have children because now it's seen as the drunk uh, drunk just uh, the drunk uh, square. So this is not just about the solution of local problems through data, but it's about the commons that can empower another commu other communities. We have made the book Making Sense, a documentary that is going to be uh, showed in Barcelona, new networks, new social capital, and new capacities for citizens that allow this process to go on after the disappearance of the steering committee. Gracias. Thank you, very interesting. But this is not a question, but, but an open debate. Could you speak a little more about some criteria, about how to interpret these uh, 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 stations for the measurement of pollution, in which there is always this doubt that they have no value, that they are not uh, reliable. How can we... Uh, uh, how, how can we prove that they are valuable data, that we can use them to have a better planning, better management about mobility of uh, city air? Because since it is true that in many cases there is the idea that uh, they are not calibrated enough because they are in the third floor or something they have some data uh, outliers because they are close to uh, uh, smoke tubes or something like that they tell us that the location of the station is done on the basis of previous surveys I would like not just this question, but as a discussion that you tell us something, how can we go on thinking that those data are reliable and that we should use them? Very good question. Several things. First of all, well, I began saying there are different things that can be done with citizen data. I do have confidence in official data, but they are not as detailed as citizen data. For example, about the pollution in a single street. So they are complementary. I trust so much official data that I build my own data as a way of complementing the official ones. I imagine the future city, all the town halls, encouraging citizens to complement their data because it's impossible to think that all the municipalities are able to install sensors everywhere in each corner. On the other hand, I think we should reconsider our protocols because there are also conventions in 2001 when Wikipedia was born, nobody trusts it. But now, Wikipedia and with Encyclopedia, with Encarta, and even it is known that the scientific researches that are quoted in Wikipedia are much more visible. Wikipedia is also forbidding some sources, like, for example, Daily Mail. They say, no, this is not reliable. 
So protocols are being improved and mindsets are being opened. The academics tend to be close in a certain kind of truth and knowing that there are other kind of protocols. When it's no, when he identify the source of cholera, his scientific community said, you're mad. This is not a reliable method. Now we know that it was a really valid method. That he invented the modern epistemology. So sometimes, in citizen sense, I think what we will have is something similar to Wikipedia, the Wikipedia development. We can complement and improve official data. For example, hey, municipality, I've detected that here there is a pollution focus, so you shouldn't install a school here. So, did I make myself understand? Understood? Could I add? Metadata, metadata, metadata. That's also important to make the data. Documentation, then that doesn't lie. Um, there's an initiative uh, with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that's trying to take all QA and QC protocols and make it available and easily accessible mm -hmm. by citizen groups for mm -hmm. this reason. So mm -hmm. if you have a dialogue with the city of Barcelona or with a political or a regulatory agency, then you're more likely to get um, your data accepted. Sí, no solo los metadatos. Not only metadata and also the notations, I also show you that it's very important that the sensor data have to be noted. And also we could ask transparency in algorithms. If you as a scientific say these data are reliable, you have to give me your data, but also the algorithm you are using. Because if not, why should I trust you? Hello. I first of all I've lived a lot of time in front of a fireman station and yes I, I can say that all these kind of diseases are produced when you are close to uh, this kind of black uh, dots of sound pollution. We had a sound measurement artifact. Botella, the former mayor, changed, made interferences in these uh, apparatus, and she said, no, we, we are not leaving. This, this was not a, a very noisy spot. Yeah, yeah, of course, this is very typical. Many times the citizens know some aspects of the city that the scientist doesn't know. If I live there, I know much better that every morning you have here some guy cooking, if you put a sensor in some spot, and there comes this kind of guy that is cooking uh, different hazelnuts, and these kind of uh, smokes are affecting your measurements. So if you are not collaborating with citizens, you you see some variabilities in the data, but you don't understand why. So that's why the notation in data and granularity in data is very important. I want to say something else in relation to the fair men. How could you tell them that at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning you don't need to put all the sounds allowed to go to a luche for a fire there? And it was terrific, really. Terrible, sorry. Somebody else? No? Okay, thank you. It was a pleasure.
There's a still a fourth project by the Ugulyako group, but they have sent the video uh, to show them, show us what they do and to be present somehow. Good evening, I'm Leire Rodriguez and I'm just talking to you about our project first. Uh, good evening everybody and thank you for having been selected as an initiative for this European Green Week that you are closing today. We are really excited to be able to count, uh, to tell you our project here in San Sebastián what is this uh, this word the municipal gardens to cultivate uh, all plants for our, the municipal gardens it was used until 2008 and then it was empty and there was a urban plan to build 30 uh, housing blocks so the neighborhood uh, resisted that. We also had the water uh, depots here. And the economic crisis didn't allow that uh, construction plans to be made, so this uh, space was closed also for the neighbors. We knew that there was something here, we couldn't get in, and that generated lots of curiosity curiosity and throughout the years we we would uh, show up at the wall and we managed to get in and we started to think how we could transform uh, to open it to the city so together with the Ulia neighborhood uh, association uh, this project was born. Which are our goals? Uh, Ulia is the neighborhood, it's a mount. Uh, Lore means uh, flower in Basque, and Barata is a uh, dock. So our, uh, our goal is this to be a urban park mm. open to everybody. Uh, we have this uh, urban planning thread always there, but uh, we could say also that uh, it's about uh, valorizing the heritage, the heritage uh, elements, also the environmental heritage, the bushes, the trees we have here, the birds inhabiting, the little toads and amphibious uh, animals we have. Another goal is to offer this space to whoever has ideas to develop uh, in it. We, together with our association, we organize festivities, uh, parties, uh, training courses, and other people, they use this uh, soil to their own uh, gardens. And other projects are open to collaboration. This very Friday, we have a World Passport uh, party together with refugees and migrants and Saturday we are uh, opening a greenhouse for invader plants. This is a 
place also in which uh, we work about uh, healthy life and with a community garden, we are doing some pedagogy to approach uh, all these uh, rural values to the city dwellers. Somehow, to close the cycle, we have urban compostage. Uh, we bring our own organic method that we use then for the gardening. The idea for this project uh, was born uh, in the beginning of 2013, and we did this proposal to the municipality for them to give us this space uh, for some time. Uh, and then we started uh, specifying the project, but we still with obstacles because the municipality didn't consider a legal formula for us. And they weren't taking us uh, seriously. We did some community work here some days, we were able to open it and start to do some symbolic uh, works to transform the place. And after two years and lots of community work, at the beginning of 2000, 2016, they gave us the keys of the place. And the project was starting to uh, follow the, its own path. And little by little, is taking shape. The first year was an explosion, not just the amount of people involved in community work, but also these so-called collateral projects. Families would come to organize a nature club for children. It was an effervescence for the whole neighborhood. And in 2018, we are really excited about the path we have made, but we still don't reach uh, the deep layers of the neighborhood. So at the, in the end of the year, we are organizing a, a meeting in the neighborhood in order to f strengthen this community work uh, project and to keep our illusion and enjoy. And every, this, is, uh, this wonderful thing I have told is, hasn't been easy because the same way we were developing our project, the parties and everything, the municipality had another plans. We sadly knew at the end of 2017 that the municipality was re considering this construction uh, project for housing for youth, saying that this wasn't a park, despising our work, and nobody believes it. Unfortunately, we won uh, that uh, legal battle because they didn't have any environmental impact survey, but we still, the municipality, is not uh, sympathetic, they don't really, they are not really committed with this. So that's why this selection is so important for us to be part of the green Europe in which we believe. And it's great because it's a way to make our uh, rulers open their eyes uh, to look up, to look close and to see that what we have here is uh, something that we all want. So thank you all. Um, hopefully you liked uh, this uh, presentation and you are invited here. And um, please remember that we are in San Sebastián, Donosti and the Ulia neighborhood. This is Parque de Viveros de Ulia and our project is our job disposal.
no. Sí, estupendo video. Wonderful video, Leire and the team. Are you watching us by streaming? Sorry for the technical problems. We are using Windows, not Linux. That could be a reason. And secondly, wonderful project and thank you for sending it. So uh, with this project we are over. So it's been 15 days, so exciting, 15 days with Interactivus Workshop. We had Franco as a curator. It's been wonderful with Elizabeth, with Cynthia. If I name everything, I'm gonna forget lots of names. It's such a huge team. It's been a wonderful workshop, a spectacular prototypes. I invite you to see Lab Zero downstairs. Today has been an intense uh, day with the closing of the Grim Europe. I would like to thank everybody involved. Uh, a wonderful team. So thank you all. And I would say that before closing, we're going to go downstairs to have a beer. And please uh, come here to the stage and we'll, be, and we'll do a photo together.